All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to Table Talk. I'm your host, Yvette Gallinar, and I am super excited to be with you today. And more importantly, I'm super excited to have a super special guest here with me tonight or today, I should say, and uh, give you a little bit of intro of who I have before me this evening. And this is Mondo Gonzalez or Pastor Mondo, should I say? And uh, he is actually the co-host of one of my favorite, favorite uh, programs to watch, and that is Prophecy Watchers. Those of you that are familiar with Table Talk know that I've talked about Prophecy Watchers a ton of times. So he's the co-host of Prophecy Watchers. He's an author. He's also a pastor. And uh, he's an astrophotographer. I enjoy those pictures you post, by the way, each and every time. Uh, he uh, attended Moody Bible Institute and majored in Jewish studies. And you can correct me if I'm wrong in any of these, these but this is a little homework I did uh, on my own. He's uh, got a master's in archaeology. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, so I'm honored to have Pastor Mondo Gonzalez. Thank you so much for joining me today on Table Talk. It's great to be here. Look forward to it. Do I add anything else to that? Because I think I'm missing some things. No, you know, you know, at the end of the day, we, we want to be known for just being a follower of Jesus who loves him and loves his word and wants to yes. see other people know him. <laughs> yes. Amen. I understand completely. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I know that we uh, messaged each other back and forth on some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. And I know for a fact that it is a jam packed program. So uh, why don't we just get right to it? Is mm -hmm. that OK with you? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Israel today. Mm -hmm. I know that we uh, have been hearing so much in the news ever since October, obviously, of uh, Israel being at war. And I want your thoughts on uh, what is happening in Israel. What uh, what are the what are the prophetic implications of the Middle East at the moment? Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it, it, to me, it's fascinating to to see the prophecies of Scripture that. We know from the book of Daniel, uh, especially as it relates to um, the, the, the foundation of the 70 weeks of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 24 through 27, it, 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 this is the angel Gabriel talking to Daniel and giving him the history of Israel in advance. And without going into all the detail, he, he describes, though, that at the end of the age, um, that desolations are determined. It's just trouble is determined all the way through, I would say, really the foundation of Israel in 1948, and we know there's been many wars that they've had uh, throughout their short history, and and it's not going to get any better. So as we as we see the end game, so to speak, what what God what God's heart for Israel is, of course, the covenants. Uh, he loves Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he has a covenant with Israel. There, they will always be His chosen people. That doesn't mean they always do well. All you got to do is read the Old Testament, right. and you can see that God had to judge his people, um, his covenant people, over and over again. Um, it, but yet, they always will remain his covenant people. But what we see coming to the end of the age here is God's desire to fulfill all of his prophecies and, and promises that he made to, his, to national Israel. Because right now, there are Jews, as we know, Jews, Israel, and Hebrews. You know, I've been writing a lot about that lately. They're all the same. Um, I know there's a lot of theories out there. But nevertheless, the, the idea is that um, there are many Jews that love Jesus. And that, and they're, they're saved. They're saved through Jesus. There is no other salvation under any other name, right? We know that. But God has a desire to save national Israel. They rejected Jesus in the first century. And so as we come to the end, that's the purpose of the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel is to finish what God began and and to fulfill all the promises. So as we come to the end of the age, the purpose of the tribulation period, and we see all these things happening right now, uh, wars and and antagonism from their their from their neighbors, it's not going to get any better. And that's right. one of the hallmarks of the the last seven year period is that ultimately the Antichrist is going to make a covenant with the Jewish people. Uh, right. You know, we, we know that again, Daniel nine twenty seven. And he's going to betray them. They're going to trust him. I believe though that they're going to trust him as the Messiah, which is, of course, a false Messiah, a, a, an, an anti-Messiah, anti-Christ. That's what it means. And that uh, they're going to realize their betrayal. And 
in the middle of the week, he stops the sacrifices, and then he goes to to seek genocide on them in, in Revelation 12. So you have all of these things that that happen during this seven year period. But um, what I like to say is that Scripture gives us a snapshot. Right. Boom. But it doesn't tell us the process many times. And so what we're watching right now is the process of this antagonism from its neighbors. Uh, no doubt anti-Semitism has uh, shown itself. It's all, It's been there, but it's shown itself to be under the surface. And now it's out in the, in the, in the open, yeah. really since October 7th, you mentioned. And it's not going to get any better because, you know, anti-Semitism is satanic. Satan mm -hmm. hates the Jews. It's, it's Revelation 12. Yes. We know that. He, it, but whom God loves, Satan hates. And yeah. it's not so much because of them. It's because of God. And, and of course, Satan's war against him. So what we're seeing now in the political, the geopolitical situation is um, really, I would say, the beginning of the scenario that we're going to continue to watch uh, wars are determined for the land of Israel. God's going to be faithful. He'll protect them. Yeah. They're never going to be annihilated. Right. But their tr the trouble is, is, is just going to be here. Yeah. Do you think the war will last a lot longer? Well, this, this, this war against Hamas, um, listening to uh, Naftali Bennett, the previous uh, prime minister and others in Israel, Netanyahu, uh, you know, we're getting ready to go into 2024 and the, it, it'll last several months at least. Yeah. But what they've already said is that unless the, the the powers that be, I don't really trust the United Nations to be favorable to Israel. That would, they obviously are not. Right. But in the sense of the United Nations Security Council, which primarily would be the United States, unless they make some changes to the northern border, uh, Israel has already said, you know, we have to go in to and remove Hezbollah, just like they did Hamas, at least beyond what they're describing as the Latani River, which is about 18 miles away from the border, because right now there's 30,000 uh, uh, Israelis uh, that have left their homes in the north along the border because they they said, we're not going to have a slaughter like what happened near Gaza in some of those communities. So Israel has now... Um, they're in deep. They're in all the way in the sense that they don't care about international opinion because they know that they can't trust anybody. The, the Holocaust has never been forgotten by them. Right. It's it's they'll, and they, there's a phrase we'll, we'll never forget. Mm -hmm. And they, as as we can see, anti-Semitism around the world uh, and the United Nations completely anti-Semitic. They cannot trust. And sadly, they can't. They trust in themselves, yeah. which. You know, we we know that God is going to allow that again during the tribulation period, where He's going to ultimately say, "Let's see how that works for you." As especially as they put their trust in this coming human figure, but the goal is for God to save Israel. Romans eleven twenty five, all Israel will be saved. But it comes when Jesus said in Matthew twenty three, "You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." And that's really what is the all of this is pushing towards yeah is their reception of jesus yeah yeah it's 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 a very interesting time that we're living in i mean if you look back at history obviously there have been turmoil in the middle east everybody hates israel around i mean you've got this i always say this to our congregation you've got this tiny nation that is basically a pimple on the map <laughs> and Everybody that it is surrounded by, they absolutely detest Israel. And so our eyes really should be focused on what is happening there because it really does determine, you know, what uh, scripture will be fulfilled as. And uh, so I, I appreciate your input on that. But there's so much talk, uh, Pastor Mondo, on the coming temple. Mm -hmm. There's so much talk um, on the red heifer for example as well and uh, i remember i i did a, a table talk once with a, a very a good friend of mine she's also my pastor uh marcia castillo we talked specifically about the red heifer because when all that was happening that they had several red heifers from texas and how they were making their way to israel imagine i started i'm sure as you did people were texting me did you hear about the red heifers did you hear about the red heifers so I, I've always been very interested in that. But you you wrote a book. You wrote about the red heifer. Uh, you wrote um, the red heifer ritual, the last piece of the third temple puzzle. 
Um, and in it, you discuss some topics such as, and I'm going to point some of these out, which are very interesting. I want you to talk about it. But you have uh, several points. What do Daniel, Jesus, Paul, and John have to say about a coming third temple? Now, I'll tell you that when we have visited Israel, I visited Israel three times. And the uh, last two times that we went, we actually visited the Temple Institute. Yeah, so very maybe good. You can talk a little bit about that. But mm -hmm. why do uh, you talk in the book, too, about why do the Jewish rabbis believe that they need to slaughter a red heifer? Um, how does the New Testament correlate the red heifer with the ministry of Jesus? And you've got a lot of information in here. And uh, when will the rabbis choose to conduct the red heifer ceremony? And lastly, should Christians support the red heifer and third temple movements? So <laughs> that's a mouthful, right? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's really interesting stuff right yeah. there. Yeah. One of the things that, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, God has guided me on a variety of things in the sense of when I went to Moody, um, I, I was in the Jewish studies program and, you know, it wasn't that most of the, the people in the program were, they were going to go work for chosen people ministries or Jews for Jesus or the things. Uh, but my desire was simply to learn the Jewish background of Jesus was Jewish. I mean, yeah. the, the Bible's written in Hebrew. It's not in, yeah. uh, you know, Chinese or something. If, if it was, I'd, I would have got a Chinese studies degree. <laughs> yeah, <know>? exactly. <laughs> When when the 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 red heifers arrived in in Israel, uh, September fifteenth of last year, of twenty twenty two, of course it's on the news, and uh, I thought you know, I I I would like to write about this because of course people are asking you know us in our ministry you know what do you think what do you think is this significant, mm -hmm. and so I thought you know what there isn't hasn't been really any specific book that's been out there that kind of covers. All of the biblical background, the theological background, and the Jewish background as it relates to the rabbis, because they write a lot about it, about this in their own writings, the Mishnah and the Talmud, which yeah. are the traditions. And so I thought, well, I, I, I want to write something just to answer the question and help guide Christians to understanding, well, why should I even care about this? Because we should care. And, and it goes back to your first thought was, uh, I guess we can answer it that way. Why should we care? Well, uh, the title, the third temple, the last piece of the third temple puzzle is that the, the scripture tells us, Daniel, in Daniel 9, 27 talks about sacrifices uh, ceasing, which are your sacrifices. Well, where do those happen? Well, they happen in a temple. And then Jesus speaks about the abomination of desolation. When you see that at the end, Standing in the holy place, that's a, de that's a designation for a temple in Matthew 24, 15. And then Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 is describing that this future Antichrist uh, coming world leader will stand in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. And you're like, well, that requires a temple. And then in Revelation 11, John is writing that he is, is, is told to measure the temple area, the temple precincts. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, oh, so... Either all those are figurative, symbolic, already been fulfilled, or again, I take things very literal. Yes. That that means that again, it gets us it going back to this, it gives us a snapshot. This is going to be there at the end. It doesn't tell us how it all happens. And so uh, we're left to speculate a little bit off the process. Mm -hmm. We know it's guaranteed, scripture is going to be fulfilled. How we get there, not sure. And so the fact of the matter is, as a Christian, Jesus told us in Mark 13, 37, after he gets done explaining all these things about the end of the age, he says, what I say to you, I say to everybody, you need to watch. I mean, that's a commandment. So as a Christian, we have a responsibility to watch. Uh, you know, in a, in a similar context, he's talking about the end of the age and his delay in Luke 19, verse 13, mm -hmm. he says, uh, occupy until I come. So th that's kind of the two things is that we need to be watching, but also we need to be busy. We need to be yes. expanding the kingdom. We need to be uh, working in our neighborhoods and other things. Uh, we don't just sit around and build a compound. Right. Um, so those are kind of the two things. But scripture tells us that this third temple is coming. But the reason why the red heifer is involved, you're like, well, okay, so why do I care about a red cow? Well, is because for the Jewish rabbis today, they uh, their, their idea of a third temple um, they've longed for it for, 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 for the last 2000 years, but for them, they realize that, um, we, it's, it kind of reminds me of when David was preparing all of the implements for the 
for the temple that he God told him he was not allowed to build. Solomon would build it. But he goes, well, I'll prepare everything in advance. And then when the moment comes, it'll be done. So what the Jews, the, the rabbinic Jews have been doing is they've been preparing all these events so that building stones, uh, mining stones, they have the cornerstone done. As you were at the Temple Institute, we could talk about that, all the things they've done there. But one of the things that's required is a slaughter of a red cow, which comes out of Numbers chapter 19. And yeah. so the goal for that is that they slaughter this cow according to certain things, and then they mix the ashes with water, and then they can sprinkle the area and others to go from unclean to clean. Right. And so that's kind of the whole background. And again, most people, um, you know, they don't maybe they haven't read Numbers 19, or certainly they don't have access to the Mishnah or the Talmud. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to make it all easy for everybody. Put yeah. it in the book, explain their thinking. And then uh, begin to describe some of the background. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I can't wait to get my hands on that. Um, I, when I did, some, well, I, I've been following you for a while. So I knew that you had written on uh, that topic. Um, what What is the most recent development of the possibility of the third temple? Do you know? If I mean, yeah. besides the, because I know that they have that menorah encased oh. in that, you know, which is, spectacular by the way i mean it i've is. got some of the pictures on it and when i visited and i'm sure you have too the the temple institute i mean they're ready they are absolutely ready and so one of the things that i did in the book was to say kind of what you just described is so what's been going on what have they been doing well not only the temple institute you, people can see this stuff online but yeah. the temple mount faithful organization and then there's another organization the third temple.org the, these groups, um, especially the Temple Mount Faithful, I mean, that began with Gershon Solomon after the 67 war. But the Temple Institute began in the, in the late 80s. And what they began to do, and, and you saw them, is they, they, they made the menorah, they made the temple of the, the altar of incense, they made the yeah. table of showbread, they made the priestly garments, mm -hmm. they have the crown, they have all the other vessels that they would use to capture the blood. Uh, they have um, so many. Everything, everything that you would need in order to begin sacrifices again, mm -hmm. they have completed. They've, they've done um, all the musical instruments. They have choirs right now that are practicing. They have music compositions. Amazing. They have Levitical things. I mean, the, you can do, you can see videos of of the of the priests getting together, singing, and yeah. and so the only thing uh, that has been missing is again the the red heifer, and they they, they they've been looking for it for for years. Yeah. You know, really began in the eighties. And, you know, red heifer here, red heifer there. But because there's biblical requirements for it, and then there's uh, Talmudic or, or rabbinic tradition requirements, and many of them have just, they, they're they red, they're supposed to be red, and if there's more than one non-red hair in a single follicle, it becomes disqualified. Right. So when you have all this, you go, wow. But September 15th changed things because the... When they brought five at one time, it, it cost them, you know, $100,000 each, plus another $250,000 to transport them. And I, I, I detail the whole story, and there's really some interesting things of how it came to be coming over to the land of Israel. Uh, but what's happening now is the just November 15th was the, the first time, and I, I'm not a dramatic person, okay, it's, but I'm not <laughs> sensationalist, this is not my nature, but... For the first time in 1900 years, we have um, four red heifers that are qualified because they became of age. They became two years and one month old. One of them has been, I would say, 90% uh, disqualified. And, and I, I'm in contact with uh, people in Israel, and they keep me up to date on on the, the, the cows. They're currently, um, they brought them all to Shiloh. There's a visitor center there where people can see the cows. They can't touch them, but they can see them. Hmm. And, uh, but four are still 100% qualified. And what they've been talking about is doing a ceremony of the red heifer. The, the ceremony of the red heifer uh, happens on the Mount of Olives. Uh, the, the, the Bone Israel is a organization that's been very involved with the Temple Institute and all this, and they have purchased property there. So they have property that, uh, which is really hard to find. I mean, this is all these things coming together. Yeah on the Mount of Olives, because as you've been there, it's it's very 
it's it's very everything's taken so yeah. for them to find property is pretty amazing but they plan on they've been discussing doing a passover 2024 ceremony where they will slaughter one of the red heifers uh in order to collect its ashes and so here we are and and i just just two weeks ago i i got contacted from a friend uh, in israel and he said hey look uh hamas is about ready to be destroyed um, we we are anticipating that there'll be no problems with our upcoming Passover ceremony uh, with the red heifer. And so they have the permits that they've been working on. And so, I mean, we're, we're living in unprecedented times. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. The, the, the question is, though, the Temple Mount. So mm -hmm. there there's just as we see it today, there's just no way that. Mm -hmm. A temple could be built. A third temple can be built there, because I, you know, I mean, we we know we know the things that are happening between, uh, you know, Israel. So, what does that tell us? What next? That what we're seeing now um, is exactly the question. So let's say that they next year or here, well, it could be sit for a few months away. Right. They, they do that now. Now, what I wrote about in the book was watching over the past 30 years, at least just me personally, seeing the way that there's been um, not only political changes, like right now, as of November of last year, this is the most religious government in the history of Israel. They have 64 seats in their in their Kurdish co coalition. That is new. And so wow. with, within there, you have the, the greatest level of orthodox rabbinic influence in what has always been pretty much a secular government. Uh, from 1948, I, I, I kind of chronicle in the book as well how most people don't realize that Israel was founded by socialists, almost communists. These were these were these were atheists, agnostics. It wasn't a religious movement at all. Oh and so, but that's changed now. And so many of them, uh, even the government, has been accused in the last six months of funneling government money over to preparations for a third temple now you didn't hear that 10 years ago no so this has been pretty amazing the one of the things that um that we sit back again we have a snapshot of this is going to happen but right. we don't have the process so and god likes to keep things um surprising because for you know one example that i use is um you know, the as it relates to Bethlehem, you know, Micah 5, verse 2, Jesus, the Messiah would have been born in Bethlehem, but he also would be would come out of Egypt, but he'd be called a Nazarene. I mean, how do we how do we tie all those scriptures together? Right. We, we would have been like, how's that gonna work? But we see <laughs> in Luke chapter two that God arranged a worldwide census and and Egypt right. and Herod, and God has it all under control. So as as we're watching politically right now, uh I honestly all of us can just guess. Will there be an earthquake that destroys the, the, the Dome of the Rock? We, we can speculate about how it will happen. But what I do know is that it will. And we're going to be surprised, I think, at how quickly it happens. But let me let me talk for a moment about it, the timing, because people will often ask, well, uh, how uh, when is the temple going to be built? Will we see it happen? Well, this is what we know, that there is a temple offering sacrifices in the middle of the tribulation period. Now, I believe in a pre-trib rapture. Not everybody does. That's okay. But all we know is this, that in the middle of the tribulation, it'll be there. Will it be there for one day? Will it be there for one week, two months, a year, 10 years? We don't know how long it will have been in action. So there's no way to guarantee that we will or will not see it mm -hmm. um, as the church. But we are seeing, as, as you've seen, the Temple uh, Institute and all these things happening the red heifers here, that just makes me realize that, I mean, that we're getting towards the wrap up. Right. Don't know. Nobody knows the day or the hour. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Yeah. And I'm with you hundred percent on, on pre-tribulation rapture. I know it's a little bit of a contentious. It, it is. Uh, it doesn't topic. need to be, but it is. It doesn't need to be. I just <laughs> finished wrapping up a program as well with a good friend of mine. Uh, she had me on and we talked in two sessions about, the the rapture and that's one of the things that i i mentioned to her i said it's it's unfortunate that christians go at each other when this you know with this topic just about 
the same way that flat earthers, you know, and you, you've got the flat earth, the not deal flat, with that too. Know, it's just, uh, unfortunately is a, it's a contentious, uh, topic and it really shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, the, the whole, the whole subject about the red heifer and the temple and everything that's going on in Israel is always of interest, uh, especially to, you know, teachers like you and I that are very focused on end time, you know, prophecies and, and whatnot. So it's always interesting to bring it about and, you know, touch on what your thoughts are, obviously, uh, quote scripture and, and go back to the scripture and stuff. But like you said, the Lord's, you know, keeps some things as a mystery for us, uh, <laughs> not to know until all, all of a sudden we get those aha moments. Mm -hmm where we go there it was all along or you know maybe the lord just all of a sudden revealed and it things there. can change so what i found was even with october 7th you yeah. know you, you know if you if pre-october 7th mm -hmm. we're talking about psalm 83 and ezekiel 38 and all these other things and and you're like man you know what i mean uh, who knows yes. but then all of a sudden this happens and so the geopolitics of Israel and the world, even with like Russia being involved in Ukraine and, yeah. and Russia being involved in Syria, now you have Iran, you know, Russia and Turkey. I mean, Turkey changed so and when Turkey when October seventh happened, Erdogan came out very supportive of Israel. Hmm. But it's like something happened. I don't know what, but he switched and all of a sudden now he was like venomous. So mm -hmm. this is where we stay with humility that things can change in a moment in the Middle East. Oh, true. It, it can. It, so I don't doubt it's going to happen, and I and then I don't I don't really guess because you're like I've watched how things can stay the same for five years and ten years, and then in a moment, everything's turned upside down. Yeah, for sure. So the bottom line is that Christians should pay attention to what's going on. Well, if if they love Jesus, <laughs> I mean. One of my favorite scriptures is John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of his commandments is to be watching. So yeah. that doesn't mean that that uh, everybody should stop reading the, the, the book of Matthew or the book of Hebrews and just read Revelation. I'm not saying that. Right. Uh, we should be balanced. But yeah. if if one of the, the aspects of our walk does not contain some element of watching, yeah. then we're disobeying what Jesus said. And um, so... The and part of it too is is for evangelistic evangelistic reasons is the world has changed since really COVID, and people have an opportunity that they're watching the world change and they're and then they go to us and they're like, hey, is this is this the end? And you go, well, let me share you what it is and what it isn't. And so I think it provides for us a balance to to be ready always to to yeah. give an answer. Yeah, absolutely. But also to be watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I, I want to switch gears mm -hmm. for a moment and uh i've been watching a lot of uh, your recent uh posts together with la marzuli and mm -hmm. so uh as you know we've talked off camera i've had a la on before and ryan peterson for example mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit about this but uh ufo agenda yes dun 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 <laughs> do the music yep um what's your take on this whole UFO phenomenon. I mean, we've got flying objects, we've got the grays, we've got abductions, we've got cattle mutilations, we've got all of this that I think lately, I mean, you would probably agree with me, we hear it so much more now in the news, right? Yep. Uh, we've seen, you know, Tucker Carlson bringing it up, yes. uh, you know, a, a lot. And some of the stuff that Tucker, Tucker has been saying, um, out of Fox now have been very interesting. I'm sure you've heard. Mm -hmm. um, what so what's what's the big deal? What what is all this about? What do you think? Uh, the I think the you know my my background of course in, in archaeology and other things is very scientific minded. You know I like data, I like facts. Um, of right. course theology is is a fact. But even yeah. if we don't allow ourselves, somebody's like yeah whatever you Christians. They what is undeniable now, as you mentioned, is that uh, the mainstream media, you mentioned Fox, Tucker, even C the CBS, 60 Minutes, uh, our government, right? The, they're having meetings really since 2017 uh, in, in, in Congress that the for something switched. And so 
even if somebody doesn't want to be labeled a conspiracy person yeah. that we move beyond that now our, yeah. our government is spending millions of dollars and these things are being exposed now so as a christian i think for us we we're, we're called to have a biblical worldview and also to have a have an answer for all things that the world wants if the world has a question we want to say hey here's a biblical answer uh now, as, when it comes to UFOs and the UAP and all that, I mean, it goes back really a long time, and it really began in, in Roswell in 1947. And, and of course, L.A. Marzulli has been doing a lot. I mean, he he's the leader in all this, and he he just has two new films on Roswell where he's interviewing actual people, the family, and other things. So, but so in that sense, I would want to just encourage the average Christian to say, hey, don't be scared to talk about this because right. it's out there. So if we can move beyond that. Now, biblically speaking, what we know is when you look at the the what has been presented uh, in the media and other research, you mentioned abductions, uh, the, the UFO phenomenon, the grays. Uh, you have, again, these whistleblowers saying that they have a craft, they have uh, biologics, that which means bodies uh, of these other beings. Now, the question then comes into, well, are, are these craft or are these beings from these other star systems? Hey, look, I love astronomy, but I, I don't necessarily or I don't believe that they're from some other uh, star system mm -hmm. that ultimately. And I think as Christians, we're too simplistic. Sometimes we just go, oh, well, they're demons. Well, demons are immaterial. They, they don't have physical corporeal bodies, but that doesn't mean that fallen angels don't. Because we know that this is why it ultimately comes back to Genesis 6, and you've had Ryan on and L.A. on. It comes back to Genesis 6, where uh, the, these fallen angels, these, these sons of God, this class of angels, so to speak, um, have, a, have a sense of physicality to them. They came down and they interfered with human women and produced physical offspring. Yeah. And so... Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 37 that as the days of Noah were, so will be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Well, the days of Noah, and in the context, you see immorality, you see a lot of things that he mentions there, especially also in Luke 17, similar. But what you have in the Genesis 6 era was a supernatural um, intervention into humanity. Yeah. Um, and so in the same way, as we approach the end of the age, what I see, the whole UFO phenomenon, the UAP, depending on how they want to phrase it, is we have a supernatural intervention with the goal of interrupting and um, uh, joining with humanity for a, a war against God. That's ultimately what it is. And so, you know, as a Christian, we don't have all of the answers. God has not revealed everything to us. But what we do know is we know that there are extraterrestrials in the sense of the angelic world. Right. Um, in that sense, not from Zeta Reticuli or whatever, you know. Right. Alpha Centauri system, blah, blah, blah. So as we come to the end of the age, and we also see that all these things come together. We have for the last hundred years, the new age, they've been talking, they've been channeling demons and the demons have been talking about the removal of a certain group of people that are hindrances at the end. And they're going to bring in this enlightenment and our space brothers are going to come. You know, interestingly too, just from a uh, secular perspective, um, you know, I, I, I'm a subscriber to astronomy magazine for a long time. Mm -hmm. And what I have watched over the last really decade or 15 years is how NASA is consumed with um, astrobiology. Uh, you, you can get a PhD right now in astrobiology, which is interestingly, you can get a PhD in something where there's no evidence. OK, think about that for a moment. But they're consumed with exoplanets. They're consumed with showing that there's life on Mars, there's life on Europa, there's life in these asteroids, and maybe that's how life came to here. They're trying to establish this idea of panspermia, that life came from somewhere else and was seeded on our planet, maybe another civilization out there. And that just kicks the can down the road because who created them? Ultimately, we know that God created all things. But it's fascinating that in all the areas, all these secular areas, they are promoting this idea that life came from somewhere else under an evolutionary paradigm. And it fits right in with the whole UFO idea is that uh, what I think, honestly, this is speculation. Okay. I, th there's, there's evidence that would show that 50, 60 years ago, that just like fallen angels appeared in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hebrews 13, two says we can entertain angels unaware. 
So we need to be hospitable. So I think that um, the evidence would show from a secular perspective that some fallen angels showed up in, in just like they did in Genesis 18. Those were good angels, but fallen angels showed up and they made an agreement with the governments of the world in order to do some nefarious things like abductions. Those are real secular. These are secular people that are not even Christians that are documenting cattle mutilations. People don't know this, but the FBI, the FBI investigated this in the 80s and 90s, thousands of cattle mutilations. And they came to the conclusion that, well, we have no idea how to explain this. It wasn't a cult. It wasn't uh, vandalism. And it's just really, really weird. And it's evil and it's, it's nefarious. So when you bring all these things together, it's this is a big mouthful. Okay? I yeah. understand. Yeah, it really is. But as we're watching as Christians, we look at this thing and we go, ah, oh, the scenario is very similar to what you have again in the days of Noah. And it's meant ultimately for deception. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's so much it, that, I mean, it blows our minds. And I was having a conversation not too long ago with um, Derek Gilbert and Sharon Gilbert. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we were talking about how, how, you know, certain things are coming to play, right? You've got this puzzle. And so these certain pieces to the puzzle are coming to play. And that's when we start like those aha moments you just said, like, yeah. oh, wait a minute. So this is happening and then that's happening. And so we start putting it together and then we can, you know, uh, um, go to the Bible and realize, okay, some of these things are here already, right? And when I think about the whole UFO phenomenon. I mean, it's, it, it can be crazy. And, and for anybody to even look at people like us and say, do you really believe in UFOs? <laughs> do you really believe in abductions that, that abductions are happening? Well, yeah, but not maybe in the sense of what you think the world is describing it. Yep. Right. And so, like you said, it's a nefarious uh, thing that's happening. And, you know, I, I don't really want to get in for the sake of time too much into, well, what are these grays or what are, you know, these, um, flying saucers? That's what they used to call them way back yep. when, right? Yep. Um, are they, are they material things? Are they uh, interdimensional? Are they, you know, what are they? So it's kind of hard to really have a conversation with other people about it. Um, first they have to, you know, get to a place where they don't think you're absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah. But then again, you have to point it back to the word of God. You have to point it back to what Jesus said, as in the days of Noah or as in the days of Lot, you know, and all of that. So, you know, it's a lot. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you because, um, I mean, I, I kind of know where you stand on it. I've heard you mm -hmm. talk about it several times, but uh, for our listening audience, I wanted to kind of touch on it, at least a little bit of a taste. And maybe next time I bring you on, we can have a bigger uh, conversation with regards to that. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot more details. So much. Even, even as it relates to the like you mentioned, the physicality, I think too often we think in terms of oh, well, angels are just spiritual. Well, that's interesting. I mean, that that's fine. I, so they certainly have spiritual capabilities. Right. But in Revelation 12, uh, it talks about an, Michael and his angels fighting against the, the other angel, Satan and his angels. And you're like, well, yeah. we tend to think of, of spiritual like a ghost. Like I can put there's a there's a form and I can put my hand through it and I can can't grab it. Yeah. Well, you know, how do angels fight in that regard? Daniel 10 is very clear that there's something more here, that there is a physical component uh, to it. And that's why it's, it wouldn't surprise me then if you have a physical craft. I think as well in 2 Kings chapter 6, as it relates to Elisha and his servant and, and the chariots of fire that you have, yeah. that you mentioned interdimensional, those are all passages that it would be fun to help people to see that, hey, this is not as 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 far out there as you think, but if we get to the nitty gritty and and we we look at the scripture with precision, yeah, allow it to speak. I think God's going to say, "Hey, don't think you know it all. Look yeah. at the scripture. I've That's given right. you these little things." And but I think tradition sometimes prevents us. We yeah. like our little things that we know, that little our box. little boxes. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. What do you? What are your thoughts though on, cause someone asked me this some time ago, I think I answered it. Okay. But, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, speaking about the fallen, the, the fallen realm, uh, demons, because you are right. A lot of, a lot of us Christians want to just chalk it off to their demons, their demons, their demons. Well, not necessarily. 
I mean, some things, yes, but not maybe not all things. And so you mentioned fallen, the fallen realm for the, the fallen angels. Obviously, we know what occurred in Genesis 6 and, and that uh, story. But wasn't, weren't the fallen, weren't the um, sons of God, um, or aren't the sons of God, I should say, in Tartarus now? Aren't they bound in Tartarus? Because Jude does say that, right? Yes. So how yes. does that? you know, come into the, into play. So th this is where it's really, really fun. And uh, I strongly recommend for those that people that are interested to read uh, Michael Heiser's work. Now I don't agree with Michael Heiser's eschatology. Okay. I, I love him brother of the Lord. He's with yeah. Jesus now. Yeah. Um, but his work in the ancient near East, I've strongly uh, yes. promote his, his, his book, the unseen realm, also his yes. book, demons, his book, angels, right. uh, even his, his, his uh, follow-up book to reversing Herman. Mm -hmm. Those are must reads because what it does is it gets you into understanding the characters in mm -hmm. all, in the unseen realm. Uh, we just think all oh, angels. Well, th there's different classes of angels, right? Um, good and bad. So you know we have we could get into all that. But so when it comes to the sons of God in Genesis six, uh, the sons of God, the Bnei Ha Elohim, appears in Genesis six uh, two and four, as well as in Job one two and Job thirty eight. So you have this phraseology that's there. But the sons of God are a class of in the Old Testament, they're never called angels, but we can just, for the sake of calling them angels, uh, these these spiritual beings that have, they're not just spiritual, they have a level of physicality to them as well. But they're a special class. There's good and bad ones. But the ones who fell in Genesis 6, 2 Peter 2, 4, says that they ha are in Tartarus now. Uh -huh. But they're there. So they're locked away. They're never interfering until the day of judgment. But that doesn't mean that there are others that have not fallen. Yeah. But they they're they're still evil as in the sense of opposed to God, mm -hmm. but they haven't fallen with women in that regard. Right. So the uh, uh, and when we say things are demonic in English, it, it's it's it lacks precision. Um, really, in our modern culture, we say, "Oh, that's demonic," which we mean that's evil. Now, if we're using it in that way, fine. But I I, I don't use it that way because it, again, it lacks uh, specificity. Demons are. Um, what we would see in the Bible, the lowest class of evil beings. Right. Um, and so if you say something's demonic, you would say, I would say, no, the, the demons weren't involved in the Genesis 6. That was the sons of God, the fallen sons of God class of angel. Uh, the demons ended up, according to your perspective, uh, ended up being the offspring of that union. And of course, going on um, through the rest of history. But so Demo the demons are they're, they're disembodied they're they're seeking to possess people right. uh, we see that in the gospels and so uh, a demon can't materialize as a physical being uh like we see the sons uh, an angel would or the sons of god so there's you have a distinction in, in class there and that's been that actually has been the 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 view of most of of christian history but i think we forget some of that's why michael heiser has done such a good job yeah. so in that regard um when we say demonic we just go, oh, it's a light in the sky. Well, what if it's physical? If it's physical, that's not demonic. Right. It is related to demons. And so that this, right. it requires a certain level of homework yeah. and uh, again, of um, specificity in describing it. Otherwise things end up getting blurred. Exactly. Exactly. Well, good, good. Thanks for clarifying that. And yeah, that's pretty much what, what my reply was. Good. Regards yep. to that deal, so. If we help people see that, they're going to go, well, I never really thought about that. I never yeah. thought about it. Because again, people see lights in the sky and not every light in the sky is a UFO. But what we've been watching and what we're seeing in the last few years is the government has admitted it and is that these, the, these craft are being tracked by radar and other uh, tracking systems that track things that are physical. It's not just a light in the sky. Yeah. It's actually something physical. Yeah. Which then it begs the question, well, where did that come from? Where did, if that if it's metal, which they have pieces, right? Where was that metal mined? I mean, it, it brings up a right. whole other layer. And so this is where I think the importance of understanding that that the angelic class has a physicality to it. And I'm not saying I know the answers of where the metal comes from. Right. But I don't think there's reason to deny. Uh, the physicality, but granted, this physicality, it kind of reminds me of Jesus's glorified body. 
he's physical. He says, touch me. Here I am. Yeah. But yet he appears and he, and he vanishes. He can right. walk through walls or appear. Himself. Yeah. But yet he says, look, I'm flesh and bone. So just because you're physical doesn't mean that you are a ghost or you can't have physicality, but yet vanish in and out um, with extra capabilities that we currently as in this body don't possess. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's, that's good. That's really good. All right. So to add to the piece of the puzzle that we were just talking about, you've got prophecy watchers, you've got sky watch TV, you've got olive tree ministries with Jan Markell mm -hmm. and the like, and all sorts of ministries that have exposed the new world order, one world government agenda. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. What we're seeing is you have so many players and uh, one of the things that I've, uh, uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation in Orlando on um, the 10 Kings because um, the, the 10 Kings, there's a lot of interpretations. And, and, and again, I'm not dogmatic about it, but what we're seeing is the typical interpretation is that the 10 Kings are 10 regional governors and, uh, and they, they come at the end of the age and the, the world is divided into 10. And, and that could be the case. Um, but I tend to see at least in Revelation 17, that these 10 kings are, are the, the word is not so much a king of a kingdom. It's, it's a figure. It's a, it's somebody who's influential. And so when we look around the world, we see these very extremely influential people because in Revelation 17, 12, and 13, it says that these 10 kings, these 10, what I call influencers will give over their power and authority to the Antichrist. Right. And they, and, and they make an agreement. We'll give you every, all of our power, all of our authority in order to you allow us to rule with you for this period of time. Because ultimately, the Antichrist rules strongly without resistance only three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Even though he's on the scene at the beginning, he consolidates everything. And then the mark of the beast is implemented. So as you look around, um, the new world order is in motion. We, we What I've been saying lately is we don't go from Mayberry. OK, mm -hmm. you know, Andy Griffith mm -hmm. to a, a, the beast system overnight. We're right. watching the new world order take shape. You know, Klaus Schwab and all of the, the people that he's trained over the last generation, uh, the Great Reset. You have these power players. You have the United Nations, the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, King Charles now is in, he's always been involved in this. But mm -hmm. you have all of these these groups and organizations and people, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, all the technology they're doing. Zuckerberg, Bezos, you, you name it, Google. We saw in the COVID pandemic how the government didn't really need to do a lot. Google censored, uh, Facebook censored, Twitter censored. I mean, they they controlled the narrative. All that technology and the, the phraseology we're going to hear from now until the end is technocracy. These technocrats, mm -hmm. they they were used by the government and joined the government in order to do the government's bidding. But the government could, the U.S. government and others, they couldn't do this without the cooperation mm -hmm. of these big corporations and people. George Soros, you could throw him as uh, in the mix oh, yeah. as it relates to elections. So when you take all that together, it is clear their agenda is one of control, surveillance, censorship, yeah. um, management, and ultimately to bring everything into a non-liberty system, which is the B system. Yes. It's the B system. Exactly, exactly. Well, there's just so much there. I, I, I could sit with you today the entire day and just pick your brain. I wish I could do that for a longer period of time, but I know that you've got uh, another interview uh, set up. So, but my goodness, there's so much, so much for us to be aware of. And like you keep saying, you know, and the Bible says, Jesus says to be watchful and not, and for us not to be deceived, be watchful, yeah. be, be, you know, uh, that you may not be de deceived. And there's so much deception happening uh, now more than ever, I believe. And, and so we need to be very, very aware uh, of our surroundings, of what's happening in the Middle East, of the, er, all everything that's happening in the news. We really need to be aware, watchful and prayerful. So yeah. um, Mondo, I appreciate your time so much. Please let our audience know where they can find you, where they can support your ministry. I'd love for you to share with us. You know, I, I, we appreciate prayers uh, more than anything else. I mean, we know this is a spiritual battle. Uh, prophecywatchers.com, uh, you can find us there and, and, and all the other places. You know, we're on YouTube and, you know, we're on Rumble. We'll have everything. But if you go to prophecywatchers.com, uh, you can see where to find us. 
and we have a lot going on. We have a weekly uh, po- podcast that we do about the week, the the weekinbibleprophecy.com, other things. And we have our magazine. So we, we, we're just getting ready to launch into radio, nationwide radio in January. So appreciate mm-hmm. people's prayers for that. And uh, again, we're, we're approaching the end of the age. It, it is exciting, but it does require um, prayer, much prayer for all of us that the Holy Spirit would continue to give us uh, discernment for our yes. times. Yes, absolutely. Well, we'll keep you, your family and Prophecy Watchers and their family as well in prayer. And we appreciate you taking the time to sit with us today. And uh, I'll have to reach out because there's a lot more that I want to pick your brain about. So thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back that. anytime. Yeah. So thank you all for watching. Be sure to share this uh, Table Talk segment with uh, your friends and your families. And we'll see you again next week. Be sure to go to prophecywatchers.com for all of the information there as well. God bless you and take care. We'll see you next time.